Hello, and welcome to Dyslexia Devoted, the podcast dedicated to building awareness, understanding, and strategies to help those with dyslexia. I'm your host, Lisa Parnello, dyslexia therapist and founder of Parnello Education Services. This show features information, stories, candid interviews, and experiences with dyslexia at all ages. Join me as we dive into today's episode of Dyslexia Devoted. Hello, friends, and welcome back. The start of the school year is just around the corner, but if you have a child with dyslexia, there's a few things that you can do to make that start of the year go a little more smoothly. Welcome to Episode 8 of Dyslexia Devoted, where we will be discussing three things that you can do to make a better start to the school year. If you want to learn more about dyslexia and how kids with dyslexia learn how to read and spell, be sure to check out my online course at parnelloeducation.com courses. Item number one to have a smooth start to the school year is prepare your child. Summer is a great time to take a break, and I'm actually not a huge fan of summer homework. I think kids need time to recharge, especially if they're the kind of kid who does regular school during the school year plus after school tutoring. There's just such long days to ask of a small child, so I feel like the summer is a great time to recharge. But after the kids have that fun break and they get to enjoy summer camp and swim lessons, it's time to start gearing them up for the school year to begin. If you're able to get some remediation sessions done this summer, then this step will actually be pretty easy because they've still had a little bit of school practice during their summer. Make sure the first time your child touches a pencil since June isn't the first day of school. For kids who have struggles in school, going from zero work during the summer to suddenly being expected to do an entire school day's worth of work and maybe homework on top of that, that first week or two of school, that can be really challenging and overwhelming. So one of the best things that you can do is to slowly ease them into that school routine again by asking them to do a few little things each day just to get them used to remembering their math facts, remembering how we read books that may not be our favorite choice books, and maybe not a graphic novel. I know my students love reading graphic novels, but then when you hand them another novel that doesn't have pictures everywhere, they get a little overwhelmed. So start easing them in by giving them some activities that they can do just a little bit a day. Set a timer. Set a timer for 20 minutes and say, hey, if you work on these two things for 20 minutes, as soon as that time is up, you get to go play for the rest of the day. Or maybe say, oh, pause on that timer because you stopped working. And we want to make sure that the kids get used to being able to do a little bit of work each day and slowly ease into the school year so that it's not the very first time they're doing something after two and a half months off on break. Now, when I say get them to do a little bit of work, I don't mean it has to be torture, but you can try and give them some fun activities that they can do in order to make the work feel a little bit more fun. So start having them read a few more books, letting them pick the book titles, but maybe setting some parameters of you have to read one regular book, not just a graphic novel, or letting them pick, you can read this one book, but then you also need to read me three minutes of this other book out loud where I can hear you get some writing practice in by having them do some journal entries about some of their favorite summer adventures. If you guys went somewhere cool this summer, because I know some people are really excited to finally get to travel again, and let them write some journal entries or draw some pictures and describe what they saw or their favorite part of the trip. That is an easy way to get the kids writing about something they enjoy. If you let the kid pick the topic of what they're going to be writing about, they'll be a lot more motivated to do the writing. I found if a student doesn't really want to write about their own summer adventures, You can also ask them somewhere they want to go and have them research that place. So if they've always really wanted to go to France, they can study France and look up cool pictures and places to go and write an essay about the things they learned that you can do in France. Give them some ideas of things that they can do and sometimes giving them a more narrow parameter. Do you want to write about something real or something fake? Do you want to write about a place or a person? And giving them a this or that kind of option as opposed to just saying, write something because that's way too open-ended for our students. They need some parameters. Give them a direction that you want them to follow. And then for math, why not play some math games? I have one that I love called Prime Climb. And the reason I like it is you can adapt it for all sorts of different ages. And I may or may not play by the actual rules of the game, but we have a modified version depending on the student. The game of Prime Climb is set up with a ring of circles with numbers on them, and the goal is to get the numbers that go from 1 all the way to 101 and to land exactly on 101. And you can use addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division in order to get there. There's different ways that you can play, and I like that you can keep playing the same board game as the student gets better. 
if a student is really young, you might start with just addition and subtraction and just using maybe just one dice instead of two dice. As they get older, you can make the game more complicated and change up the rules and say, all right, now instead of just addition and subtraction, I want you to try to use multiplication also and give them different challenges of what you want them to try to do. And you can keep playing the game and just do it in a different way. Another one is playing war with the card game, like the old fashioned card game where each person pulls out two cards and you decide who has the bigger one wins the war, so to speak, with their playing cards. You can play that same game using multiplication, addition, subtraction. Division doesn't work quite as much, but using a just basic deck of playing cards is an easy way to play a game where the kids can practice multiplying, adding, and subtracting in order to get to uh, the right numbers. So you can decide if you want to make the face cards like king, queen, jack, if you want to make them worth 10 or worth zero or what you want to do, or if you want to just put them off to the side and just play with the regular numbered cards. It's one that's a really easy game to play and most people can find a deck of cards in their house. And it's a way that you're practicing math without feeling like torture and it's nicer to ease the kids into the school year if they have had a little bit of practice with some of their routine um, math facts and stuff. Now on to tip number two to have a smoother start to the school year. That is to prepare your routines. What does your house look like in the summer? Are the kids sleeping in? I know that is the best part of summer, but I'll be honest, I'm not very good at that part. My dog has decided what time we're waking up, whether I want to or not. And so we want to make sure that we slowly start adjusting that bedtime and wake up time so that on the first day of school, they're not suddenly having to wake up two hours earlier than they have all summer long. If you can make that transition smooth and steady and just change it by 10 or 15 minutes a day, it'll make it a lot easier by the time that first week of school comes along and they won't be dragging and they won't be so grouchy that first week of school. Now, the other thing that you can do is help build up some independence. During the summer, the kids get really used to having somebody around them all the time that can help them pretty quickly, especially if you have a smaller family and there's only, you know, one or two or three kids, then they can get help pretty quickly when they need it. But then what happens when they go back into this classroom and there are 20 students and one teacher, or maybe more than 20 students, they really have to wait longer for their their turn. So getting them used to building up their independence of trying to encourage them to solve their problem themselves and say, hey, what can you do about that? Instead of solving it for them or instead of solving it right away of saying, I'll help you, but let me do this one other thing first and letting them get used to saying, yes, just wait a second because that is often a big challenge for kids transitioning back into the school year, especially for a kid who often needs more help than a lot of their classmates, is when they have to wait longer for that help. And in which case that can cause some frustration. So if you can just do it in low stakes settings where just you slowly build up their ability to wait just a little bit longer if they need to, it'll make it a little bit easier at the start of the school year. One thing to know is transitions are gonna be hard no matter what you do. Even if you try your best, Sometimes those transitions can be really challenging. So if you can give them some heads up and some warning of, hey, this is who your new teacher will be, or this will be your new class. Or if you know one of the classmates, you can say, hey, guess what? So-and-so is going to be in your class this year. So if you can try to give as much forewarning on the things you do know, it might make that transition a little smoother if they have a little bit of warning of what to expect. So here are a few things that you can do to help make that transition easier. One is that you can help them pick out their school supplies and work together to make a checklist of what you guys are going to do on that first day of school. What is that first day going to look like? What time are you going to leave the house? What are you going to do when you get there? What time are you going to come pick them up? And then also you can create routines and showing what is the order to get all the materials together when you leave for school in the morning and taking pictures with a checklist of what is the routine going to be for the new school year, especially if that routine has to change from the previous school year. Maybe the siblings go to different schools now if somebody moved on to middle school. Maybe the start time of the school year changed or you change schools. And if you can give them some routines and predictability, that'll make that first week of school a lot more easy to transition into if they know what to expect. If you have a checklist of, all right, first you wake up, then you're going to eat your breakfast, then you'll brush your teeth and get dressed or whatever your order is in your house and help them see what the routine is going to be have them make little pictures if they can't read the words on a checklist to get ready in the morning. Have a little poster with the different pictures of what you want them to do and build up some independence so that maybe you won't be nagging them to hurry up and make it out the door if they already know what they need to do next, especially if they're siblings and you have to help multiple kids get ready in the morning. 
And then next is to start practicing them, even if you're just taking a trip to the library or the grocery store. All right, we're going to do our morning routine, get them into the routine of what it will look like when they get ready for school. But instead of going to school, maybe you go somewhere fun like the park. Now on to tip number three for a smooth start to the school year, which is to talk to the teachers. Make sure you tell them about your child's strengths and weaknesses And make sure they explicitly know that your child has dyslexia and any other learning differences such as ADHD or maybe school-based anxiety when it comes to writing or spelling lists or things like that. And while we know that schools are supposed to pass the information along to the new teacher, sometimes it doesn't always work out that way. And there's all sorts of different reasons for this. Sometimes the teacher who had your child before may have left the school, so they didn't tell the new teacher if they didn't even know who the new teacher was going to be yet. Perhaps they did tell the next year's teacher, but then that next year's teacher ended up, you know, quitting over the summer and they didn't return for the new school year. Or maybe a student was slated to be in one class one year and the teacher passed along the information and then suddenly they changed which class they're going to be in and now the new teacher never got the memo. We want to make sure that we set the kids up for success. I can't tell you how many times I've had a student come to me that first couple weeks of school in tears during our session because the new teacher didn't understand them and their dyslexia, and they didn't understand that they really truly needed their accommodations, or that they really truly couldn't do what the class was being asked to do. They were too scared to say in front of all their brand new classmates, I can't do this. I really need a lot more help than this. That's not something a kid feels comfortable saying in front of their brand new classmates that they hardly know. And even if they do know them, that might sometimes make it even harder. We want to make sure we set up the kids for success and give the teacher some forewarning in advance. And while we wish that all the messages got passed along, sometimes it doesn't happen. We can think ahead and think about what problems might happen. And just make a simple note, sending a quick email to the new teacher and say, hey, wasn't sure if you heard, my child has dyslexia. Here are some of the accommodations he's used to having, and this works really well for him. Or you can say, hey, my child has dyslexia and currently is only able to read you know, really simple words and sentences, anything that's at grade level, he really needs an audiobook. Or you can say that my daughter's getting dyslexia remediation, so she can practice spelling at home, but the spelling lists that you guys are giving in class are not the patterns she's learning in remediation and are way too challenging compared to what she's learning in her dyslexia remediation classes. Making sure that the teacher knows where the starting point is for your child and that you're working on it and that there's a plan in place to try to get support but to be but to be understanding and patient if the child is struggling in class. It is critical to help set up those accommodations from day one so that the student is getting exactly what they need and if they start building up some confidence and are able to do some things without their accommodations because they feel more comfortable and know what to do, then that's great. But if you want to make sure that they have those accommodations available to them instead of waiting for two weeks after they started already feeling behind and getting really upset, at going back to school again. Another thing another thing to do is to let the teacher know about challenges that occur because of dyslexia. Dyslexia is really not very well understood, and unfortunately, people don't realize there's more to it than not being able to read, and they still think it's all about seeing letters backwards. And our students don't see things backwards, they just haven't learned the explicit instruction needed for how to sound out the words, but it also affects other areas such as not remembering math facts. A lot of times kids with dyslexia need to use a calculator where they know how to do the math, but quickly recalling those math facts, especially multiplication and division and things like that quickly, can be quite challenging. Or they might struggle with following directions, not because they're not listening, but they can't remember the sequence or the order. So if the teacher tells them five things they're supposed to go do, by the time they do number two, they might forget what number five was. We want to make sure that the teacher knows the other ways that dyslexia can affect that child's school day. Do they need extra breaks? Do they need to be able to get some extra help after school? Do they need some extended time? So pass along that message so that you can help the student be as successful as possible from the get-go. So to recap today's episode, we covered three ways that you can help your dyslexic child have a better start to the school year. Number one, prepare your child to get back in the swing of things by doing small academic tasks now. Try to make them as fun as possible, not torturous. Number two, Prepare your routines at home. What is it going to look like that first week of school as you prepare your morning routines? 
Let the child help pick out some of their lunch boxes and school supplies and have them help you make a poster of the checklist of what your morning routine is going to be for the new school year. Practice being able to wait a little longer to get support because in a classroom, you can't get help as fast as you can at home when there's only one or two other kids around. And number three, talk to your child's teachers about dyslexia and how that affects your specific child. And I hope these three things will help you get a much smoother start to the new school year. And I hope it's a fantastic start to the year when those days come. Although I'm going to squeak out that last little bit of summer as much as I can. And I hope you do too. All right. If you want to learn more about dyslexia and structured reading programs, be sure to check out my online course at parnelloeducation.com forward slash courses. Have a fabulous rest of your day. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Dyslexia Devoted. Join us for our next episode by subscribing to this podcast as we devote each episode to different aspects of dyslexia. See you next time.